Hey everybody, Stu Smith here going live. I hope you are well today. Today is our CSS Swim Critique Show, but before we get there, let's talk a little bit about today. What are you doing today? What kind of workout are you getting done? Are you getting it done no matter what? That's the key. Because sometimes it really does come down to not making excuses and just getting it done no matter what. Whether it is snowing outside, which it was here today, about 25 degrees, and about six inches of snow where we normally work out. So we brought shovels, dug ourselves out, got things done. A lot of fun. <clears throat> A lot of fun, in fact. They even had some snowball fights. So... One thing I did find, though, that has been life-saving, this, oh, I shouldn't say that, has been very nice, right, <laughs> is I bought a pair of OnCloud waterproof shoes, and my feet were dry the entire workout, even though there's six inches of snow, a lot of slush, kind of puddles, you know, going through, um, at the end of two almost two and a half hours of being outside um, my feet were a little cold but they were dry makes a huge huge difference in how you feel when you're running uh, I remember just hitting a couple of puddles and I'm still not quite used to running in waterproof shoes hitting a couple of puddles and just thinking ah I felt that water hit my shoe I know my foot's gonna be wet in three two one not wet. Highly recommend. And you have to make sure they're waterproof and not water resistant because I've played around with like three different brands and two of them were water resistant, not totally waterproof. And uh, that makes a makes a big difference in um, how well you are insulated from that type of just splashing. And it's not that big a deal. I mean, running around with wet feet's not a huge discomfort, but it's just one of those little nagging things that you know in the winter or when it's raining, there's going to be puddles. You're going to step in it. You're going to have wet feet by the time the run's over. And you know, if you're running a long distance, that could could make be the difference of you getting a blister, wet, cold feet, or just being unnecessarily uncomfortable. But I highly recommend them if you haven't had them. But yeah, we had a nice little snow today. I don't know if you saw it. Posted some pictures up on Instagram. Pretty fun. Just shoveling out. But, you know, not every day is going to be perfect weather. And you're you're not every day you're going to have enough time to train. So you got to just get something done. And one thing I, <clears throat> two things I like to do. The first thing is I say, I don't have to be here. I get to be here. Because there are countless people that, just can't do what I do, whether that is for lack of time, their commute starts at five o'clock, um, physically ill, uh, injured, you know, whatever that is, but I get to do this. That's a huge mind mindset uh, change right there, you know, especially when I'm starting that warm up. And I know the first 10 minutes are just going to suck. And I say, you know what? You don't have to be here. You get to be here. And that that changes my mindset really quickly. And then the other one is, um, especially when I'm laying down in bed before I've gotten up and I'm thinking, oh, I really don't want to get up right now. And I almost get mad at myself for thinking that. And so now it's I'm forcing myself to get up and go do it. And I'm almost pissed at myself for thinking I just was about to quit. Right. So instead of that, you know, I go do something even though I don't feel like it. And I think that is that is a true sign of discipline in your life somewhere. And it can be anything. It can be working out first thing in the morning. It can be studying late at night. It could work in overtime, whatever that is. You can apply that kind of 
get pissed at yourself mindset and just get it done. Um, and it's, I usually do it just to spite myself, right? I don't feel like doing it and I go do it anyway, because damn it, I need to do it. And I know I will always feel better after having done something. I think that's probably the most important takeaway from this is that if you think skipping something that you need to do is going to make you feel better, you're actually probably going to feel guilty that day and that you didn't do anything. <clears throat> you're going to feel better just getting it done. So get comfortable getting uncomfortable. It will help you. Um, let's see. So yeah, check out the, the, uh, link here. Cause this is a article I wrote a while back on the topic of mindset and I highly recommend it. It's a good read and, uh, it just makes you kind of get, have that get it done mindset. Really? So what do we have here? Someone's starting the, uh, Eureka is starting the pyramid workout today. That's a good one, but it's okay if I'm not able to go to the top. Well, the top is your definition of the top. So, for instance, I like to use that pyramid as an assessment tool. All right, when you first get started, you may see a 110 back down to 1 pyramid. That's just for looks, right? It is what it is for you. So let's say you fail at seven, come back down on the back end of seven, right? Or keep on going up, but maybe pull-ups are probably what's going to make you fail first, typically. So take two sets to get that rep. So let's say you fail at, you get seven, but you fail at eight. Um, you know, do your whatever four pull-ups do your push-ups, do your sit-ups, or whatever exercises you're doing in that little circuit. Come back, finish that set of pull-ups if you can, or use assisted. Get bands to help you on those reps that you can't get on your own. So always start off with the reps on your own, and then resort to an easier version of that rep, of that exercise, whether that is a pull-down, assisted have somebody help you up and you come down slow <clears throat> just go up as high as you can and then the next time you do it you never know you might get a, a higher a higher level so it's a great assessment tool just to see how you're doing yeah i have to agree with you alex worst feeling ever is skipping a workout there are worse feelings but that's one of them that just ruins, kind of ruins my day. Running at 9.30, uh, running a 9.30 mile and a half on the PST, should I try to get sub nine before I ship out? Uh, <clears throat> it's not bad. I mean, I wouldn't sweat the uh, the nine or 9.30 because chances are you're probably only going to be taking one more PST and then that's going to turn into four mile timed runs if you're going to Bud's. And that needs to be at a little slower pace, actually. You know, so if you can run uh, two miles in 14 minutes and run four miles in 28 minutes, you're going to be in a good zone for weekly four-mile timed runs at Bud's. That's your next hurdle. I think you got accepted now. Maintain a 930. Don't fall, you know, above it. You know, don't don't neglect this whatever 615 pace there. And um, next thing you know, you're you're running 1030s. So you still need to run some fast interval stuff, run some fast mile and a halfs. But you also need to work on your pace to be able to easily get a 28 four mile timed run. Because I promise you, at the end of a week, if you have a four-mile timed run on Thursday or Friday, and you've done log PT and lunges and all the stuff for the previous days, if you're not ready to be tired and run a 28 to 30-minute four-mile timed run, you'll fail. So get good at four-mile timed runs. 
that's your next step. All right, so I am going to pull up some <clears throat> swim videos here real quick. Looks like I got a few that I can share with you guys here. The volume here, because that's distracting me. All right, so got one question here from Ian. I know you've mentioned in the past you went through buds using the scissor kick for treading. Do you think anything would have been easier if you knew the egg beater, or is it basically the same? No. It would be much easier. I basically gut checked that tread drill and it just sucked. <clears throat> um, you know, so, I mean, here, here's the thing. You need to know how to scissor kick tread because you're going to be scissor kick treading with fins in second phase. But the first phase tread you know, you can do scissor kick or you can do egg beater or you can do a mix of both. Now, after knowing and practicing both for years now, I'm good at it. So it's actually a useful tool. When I was 22 and not good at egg beater, it was not a useful tool. So I just did little flutter kicks or bigger scissor kicks. And that's how I just did everything I could to stay away stay afloat so it wasn't pretty but it got the job done <clears throat> so yeah i wish i'd have known <clears throat> what i know now put it that way let's share some uh share my screen here so we're gonna go over to my instagram messages boom send this let's see here kick off the wall that's a solid kick off the wall like that one top arm bottom arm kick hold the glide oh i like this one mississippi two mississippi pull yeah this is perfect i literally don't have anything to say right now i mean i think that bottom arm could be a little more of a scooping motion of the what's called a um Breaststroke skull, S-C-U-L-L, -L, versus a big, you know, full reach, reaching arm pull. Um, and that turnaround needs to be a little faster, definitely. But this is good. Top arm, bottom arm, kick, hold that glide. Man, that's awesome. I mean, even with that really slow, look at this turnaround. One Mississippi, two Mississippi, three Mississippi, four Mississippi. He didn't know I wanted him to do a, a full lap. So he spent about three Mississippis over there, and he still did a 49 seconds. So this doesn't look fast, but it's about 46, 47 second 50. And it's just smooth. And you can see where it's smooth. That's right here. It's got a solid kick, good streamline, holds that glide for one Mississippi, two Mississippi pull. Yeah, a little bit short on that one, but it's good. That's a good CSS. All right, let's see. The pull up line. One. Yeah. <clears throat> All right, you guys see this one? Make it a little bigger. Oh, this is one of my favorites. This I, I think I've shown this one before, but you see this streamline? I mean, that's how you streamline. His head's down. He's got biceps touching his ears one hand on top of the other elbows locked out i mean he looks like a torpedo in the water and notice that's one stroke to get across the pool two strokes to get across three <clears throat> four four strokes it's pretty good and he does this in like 42 seconds so this is a seven minute pace swim right now now he's got a high elbow recovery which probably needs to go underwater which i would call him for sharking on this one but that's an easy fix just go underwater damn that's one of, that's one of the best swims i've ever seen and he's a non-swimming athlete that's just smooth.
Like, notice the scoop of the bottom arm. See how he just kind of grabs it. Let's see if you can see it on this this back side here. Top arm, bottom arm. Boop. Yeah. Here, let me show you that bottom arm scoop again. All right, so that's a really good bottom arm. See what I'm saying? So he just grabs a little bit of water and doesn't go all the way down. His hand doesn't go all the way down to his uh, swim trunks. Yeah, that's smooth. And that's a great turnaround as well. You guys could just watch this one all day. I think I have it up on TikTok and on my reels somewhere. All you got to do is say, look for excellent CSS something. I can't remember what I did on that one to call it what it is. Um, yeah, but that's just insane. All right, so that was that one here. Let's see what this All one right, looks like. All right, this is a new guy. That, new uh, guy, first time with us. Kick off the wall. All right, Hang so on. My voice is interrupting me. All right, so he kicks off the wall. Kind of weak on the uh, kickoff. But he's got a top arm, bottom arm, kick. Kind of pops up his head a little bit to breathe. Kind of a sweeping motion of that top arm pull. Could be a little more unidirectional <clears throat> kind of grabbing water like a freestyle catch versus this shoulder rotation to get it all just grab water a little better but it's not bad i mean we're looking at what are we looking at here 50 yeah it's a little slow 58 seconds Top arm, bottom arm, kick, one Mississippi, two Mississippi, pull. Yeah, he's a little little loose on his glides. See how his feet are kind of apart? You know, his glide's not bad. It just looks like he's swimming like a banana. Could be a little looser on the shoulders. I think his shoulder mobility's uh, causing him to not be perfectly streamlined. He does spend a lot of time on his side. It's up to you if you want to do the side stroke on your side, the CSS on your side. It's it's fine. I personally like to kind of rotate a little bit towards my belly after kicking, which he does a little bit better here. I just find that shoulder often plows the surface. So it's a little slow. We got to put a little more power on that kickoff, build up some momentum. Um work on that top arm pull to do more of a freestyle catch. Got a good kick. I like the kick. I think he could just probably keep his feet together instead of like just letting them fall apart, kind of gl glide and separate about a foot apart, just affecting the streamline a little bit. But I'm being pretty nitpicky on this one. He's got the stroke down pretty well. The popping up of the head to breathe is probably the biggest issue he needs to fix. And being a little tighter on the arm recovery. Just a little. That's not bad. I like that. Let's see. There's three already. I'm going nuts on these uh, CSSs here. Let's see what I got here. Might have another one. Looks like this was a recent submitted one. Let's see what we got here. All right. Yeah, this is excellent. Got a little breaststroke kick going. Good glide. I like the glide phase. A little high elbow probably needs to drop that down a little bit. There you go. That's a little better. I don't like the flutter kicks after the breaststroke kick. That's just a waste of energy and probably even slowing you down a little bit. Just affecting your slip. See how your feet are close together there? That's where you want them on the glide. So keep your feet together. Don't do this waste of energy flutter kick. That's just really not helping you. But you got a good breaststroke kick. Use it. Top arm, bottom arm, kick. Hold that glide. Yeah, lay off the little flutter kicks. I think that's just going to affect your uh, affect your deal there. So looks like, what do we got here? 50... 
Yeah, you're looking at a, a meter pool with like 54, 55. So you're about, you're about a yard per second pace. So this isn't bad at all. Just clean it up a little bit with the flutter kicks. Got a good streamline. You got a powerful kick. Nice pull out. That looks really good. All right, let's see. I think I might have one more. I'm just doing all these all at once here. Um, let's see. What's this one? All right, so what was this? Let me see. Kick from the start. Kick off the wall too deep. Almost touching the bottom. Make, makes an awkward breaststroke pull out. Then you got to kind of swim up to the surface at an angle so you just added distance to your swim minimal but there's a lot now you got an awkward glide position looks like you're kind of corkscrewing yourself a little bit that glide might be a weak back kick that's not really bringing you out straight um because it, it seems like you every time you kick you kind of turn into the could be could be your streamline position too, because you are kind of swimming like a banana. Notice this glide here. Now you can't really see it from here. Yeah, see that right there. You just kind of like if you were swimming in open water, you'd just be making a left hand turn. Probably if you had your eyes closed, you'd swim a complete circle in about probably about three minutes. Uh, too deep off the kickoff. That's because of your shoulder mobility. Once again, I, I think one of your biggest problems is instead of being in this position right here for the glide, you're in this position. And that's just causing you to keep turning left. <clears throat> like it wouldn't surprise me if you like didn't have mask on, you'd be hitting that lane line right there. Overall though, not horrible. I think you can definitely fix it with um, some shoulder mobility work. All right. Let's see. Stop screen. Okay. I might have one more. I think I had a submitted one earlier today that got downloaded onto my uh, computer. So it's not up on uh, Instagram. We'll see if it pops up. If it pops up, I'll show it. Um, let's see. Volume down. All right. Yeah, I'll show this one in a minute. It's ready to go. Let me see what you got. I read an article that says about the importance of keeping a positive, funny mindset when facing all the obstacles that the course throws at us. Can you elaborate on this? Yeah. I mean, just laugh, you know, don't get too caught up in <clears throat> constant negative feedback because it does get funny after a while. Uh, but I would say this, take it seriously to where you are in the moment working through problems, right? If you're getting called out on the way you're doing something, take that moment seriously work through it so it's no longer an issue and that instructor does not have to spot correct you with one-on-one -on -one training, which is probably the worst kind of training at BUDS, especially if it's a physical event. If it's a shooting event or something tactical, that's excellent kind of training. But, you know, because you're not doing push-ups well enough or you're not running fast enough and you get called out on it, that's never fun. But take it seriously work through the problem, laugh about it later. That's the key. Don't let it beat you up. You may get told you're the worst student ever and you don't belong here. How do you handle that? Right? Do you let it eat you up inside and like make you doubt yourself? A lot of people do. You know, you just got to laugh at it and say, you know what? I belong here. I've worked my ass off for this. I'm going to fix whatever this issue is and move on. That's the way you deal with it. 
I'm only able to swim twice a week as of right now. What do you think I should do swimming wise on those days to help prepare me for the PST 50, 50 fins? Um, I would do both. I would say get your 50, 50 swim workouts in, you know, if those get easy, make them 75, 75s, 100, hundreds. And then as a cool down, um, get a thousand to 2000 yards swim with fins in. So that's going to take another 15 to 30 minutes of swimming with scuba fins. So that's what I would do. That way you're taking care of like your upper body day swim and your lower body day swim. I'm just putting it all in one kind of equals four swim days in my book. So if you look at my workouts, yeah, warm up with a 500 always. Because I want you to one day take a PST and be able to say, oh, this is my warm-up. Easy day, right? You warm up with a 500 long enough, when you take that PST, you can actually go in there and chill because you can say, oh, this is my warm-up. Going to warm up right now, crush it with a 845, easy. You know, that's your warm-up pace, right? You really want to put out, get sub-8. If you wanted to, but that's going to be kind of where you need to be um, and dependent on your abilities too. like that one guy, you know, he's swimming seven minutes. And if he wanted to really put out, he could probably break seven. But I'm telling him, you know what? Just go in there, pace yourself, get a 730, 745, still be faster than anybody else in the pool. Save some energy for the rest of the PST. Because the last thing you want to do is blow it all on the swim. You get a 645, everybody's going to say, wow, that's fast. But then you got nothing left for the rest of the test. People are going to laugh at you for just being a swimmer. So you got to strategically look how you're going to deal with this. Because you want a good score on everything, not just the swim. All right, so let's see what we got here. Kick off the wall, not bad on the streamline. One dolphin kick, two dolphin kick, three dolphin kicks. Don't need all those dolphin kicks. Just do one. Top arm, bottom arm, kick. I like to turn with the top arm, breathe with the bottom arm. You're not quite doing that. Notice how you're turning and breathing with the bottom arm. Just turn with the top arm, breathe with the bottom arm. Makes this whole thing a little smoother. But these dolphin kicks here... You don't need one, two, three. I, the, later in the swim, they're completely unsustainable. Now, on this one, look at that. You're turning your head with the top arm. Oh, you did on the first two. You didn't with this one. So I see you're trying. Just remember, turn your head with the top arm. Breathe with the bottom arm. You can use this little mnemonic. TTBB. Turn with the top. Breathe with the bottom. Pull, breathe, kick, glide. Let's see, Stu, love your information and knowledge. Does your book contain training programs similar to Navy SEALs Guide to Training? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that's that's what all these do. I mean, I got over 40 of them, and they're all workouts, just like the way I write them in other programs. <clears throat> Currently doing a nine-week program, push-up, pull-up, sit-up, running, and swimming daily. Oof, I don't like that. I like running and swimming daily, but I tell you, at one point, <sighs> um, daily pull-ups, push-ups, and sit-ups at a high volume, like if you were just waking up like you're a 50-year-old guy doing 25 push-ups every day to wake up, 10 pull-ups every day to get moving, no problem. But if you're doing 100 pull-ups, a couple hundred push-ups, a couple hundred sit-ups every day, at the end of the week, probably be fine. Two weeks, three weeks, maybe. Might even see some gains. But there's going to be a point where that just goes downhill and you just screech to a halt and maybe plateau for four to five weeks. And then if you're still not, if you're still doing it, you're probably going to see negative results on PST scores. Because as with anything in fitness, 
you need recovery days. I mean, you're trying to build muscle. You're also trying to build strength endurance, which I understand the idea of doing some daily activity. Um, but any prolonged daily activity typically means you are going to see negative results or elbow shoulder tendonitis. Been doing this a long time. Tried it. Saw it myself. You know, see it all the time. That's why I only do upper body days three days a week max when they're calisthenics. Let's see. Whatever consider. Oh, sorry. Thought this was a question about fitness, but it's a some guy spamming me on his online revenue business. When you say recovery, do you mean active recovery like stretching or nothing? Um, I'm always doing active recovery. So when I say recovery, it means eating well, sleeping well, which should be every day, um, stretching, mobility work, um, hydrating. There's more to recovery than just not working out, right? Um, I mean, for instance, we are doing a sort of recovery week this week. We're in the middle of a lift cycle. We did three weeks of lifting for the last three weeks, which has been pretty challenging. Some days or two a days, we're getting after it. So this week is a deload week, our fourth week. Same in, as in this workout here. This is our winter lift cycle where we started the block periodization model. You can kind of see it here. Three to one block periodization. What that means is we go three weeks of lifting, one week of cows and cardio. So we're deloading, but we're just changing elements of fitness that we're working on. Instead of strength and power, speed and agility, we are going to just run a little bit, work on some aerobic running and swimming, and do calisthenics not necessarily killer high reps but moderate moderate reps um and that's really kind of depends on your definition of moderate right so that's our deload week this week hey Stu, just a fun question guys say you can tell who will never make it, but you can never know who will make it. Have you ever had a candidate that you thought wouldn't make it and made it? Um, I will say this. I, I can't say that I actually thought they wouldn't make it because here's the deal. You know, I help a lot of people prepare and very rarely do I see somebody who do does not have the physical abilities, wh what I think the physical abilities are to make it through whatever program they're doing, whether it's BUDS or it's SWAT team training, whatever it is. Um, but there's more to it than just the physical because there's you getting into your own head, the instructors getting into your head, the cold getting into your soul because <laughs> that will change people's minds real quick when you're cold, wet, and sandy at night and you don't see an end to the day. That's brutal. Um, you know, also, you know, under a load, right? That gets a little bit of a pain. It may not be necessarily a strength issue that you're having, but a boat pounding on your head hurts you know you're gonna have bruises on your head probably hair rubbed off by the time you're done with with hell week running with a log on your shoulder you might be strong enough to do that fine but there's a point when you have a log on your shoulder where it just hurts i mean it feels like it's bruising your collarbone right so there's a lot to training than just getting someone physically able to do it. And I think I have a pretty good solution to that because here where we train, 
we train outdoors all the time, regardless of weather. Like I said, today was six inches of snow, 25 degrees. We ran outside, lifted outside, did calisthenics outside the whole time. You know, that's just the way it is. Um, but it's not the way it's always been. Um, we used to do stuff indoors uh, before COVID, but I found it to be very helpful to be outside. You're going to be getting used to working outside. You might as well get used to the cold, get used to the hot, get used to humid. Um, so there's a, it really comes down to your training. How bad do you really want to do this? Because I promise you there will be a point in your training where something flashes in your brain and says, why are you doing this? And you better have a good answer to that question that um, uh, is about to plague you and your decision-making ability when you've been in hell week for 12 hours and you haven't seen the end of the first day yet and you know you got five more of them or four more of them to go. You don't see a light at the end of the tunnel. You got to make that tunnel shorter and say, you know what? I'm just making it to the next meal. Let me eat, regroup, you know, get fueled up, come out here, refresh, and be able to handle the next six hours. So, but no, I really don't have, I'm shocked when people don't make it more than I am shocked when people do make it. How's that sound? Because they had the tools, they just didn't have the mindset to finish. Everyone is good when they are fed and slept well and the night before. After a few days of barely eating and not sleeping, things change. Oh, yeah. Very true. Google recommendations for long-term swimming training. I mean, that's one way to do it. Um, also, thank you for the time and effort you've dedicated to help others. Yeah, no problem, man. I enjoy it. You know, I consider myself a coach. I work out and write about it. I am self-employed, love my life. So this is my office in the basement of my house. I am certifiably unemployable. So I don't think I could ever work for anybody ever again. <laughs> so Ian says, thanks for the CSS critiques do right after kicking off the wall instead of dolphin kick. Should I do... Breaststroke kick, underwater, pull, then another breaststroke kick, then breathe. No, here's the deal. When you kick off that wall, in fact, I want you to read this article because there's a whole debate out there about uh, pullouts, doing the breaststroke pullout or not, right? In fact, the name of this article is called To Pull Out or Not, CSS Debate. Kind of a funny uh, title, I know. Don't go there. Uh, but read this article because you may not even need a breaststroke pullout. Kick off that wall, super streamlined. You know, let yourself glide it out. Boom, turn to breathe right there. Skip the whole breaststroke pullout, kick and recover, turn to breathe. You know, because here's why. Time yourself in a hundred with breaststroke pullouts. Time yourself in a hundred without them. All right. If you find yourself in a 500 and you're skipping your breaststroke pullout because you just can't handle the breaststroke pullout, big deal. Take it out. At least you've now managed to, um, you know, get through the swim without the breaststroke pullout and you get an extra breath with the same number of strokes because you got to count that as a stroke to get across the pool. Um, so my advice is if you're doing a breaststroke pullout, one, make sure you need to do it. Is it making you that much faster? 
Is it making you that much more efficient? And the answer is test it. See if it is, right? Do a, you know, a kick off the wall, hard glide, start the stroke without the breaststroke pull out. For a full 500, if you want, then do it without, with a breaststroke pull out. One, see how you feel afterwards. Two, see if it's faster. If you're not gaining any speed out of it, why do it? You know, you're just getting more winded because you're taking out a breath per length, which, you know, it's 20 different, 20 breaths in a 25-yard pool. Might make a difference between your heart rate getting aerobic or anaerobic, too. Um, that's a good question. Oh, goggle, <laughs> goggle recommendation. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> that's not your fault. That's my fault. I read, uh, I read that wrong. So goggle recommendation. Uh, you know what? I'll be honest with you. I haven't bought a pair of goggles for 20 years. And the reason why is I find them on the pool deck all the time and I pick them up and I use them. Right. Um, no, I'm just to keep teasing, but I do use them. Like I don't even bring, just borrow the pools. Like there's a lost and found hanging on this coat rack of nothing but goggles. I just grab them, put them on, go for my swim, put them back. Um, but no, I usually just go with like speedo goggles. <laughs> so, all right, that's a good one. Goggles, not Google. That's my fault. Or could I just come up and breathe after gliding off the wall? That's what I we just talked about. Um, read that article. Pull out or not. How do you recommend implementing bulletproofing exercises and injury prevention? What are some most common injuries you see in spec ops training? Um, my advice is make sure you're addressing mobility and flexibility every day it's it's going to help you with swimming it's going to help you with treading it's going to help you with streamlining all of those little shoulder mobility hip knee and ankle mobility all are big issues with injury and if you can stay on top of them and just be loose right but strong and sturdy um, because you're lifting and doing calisthenics that's uh, that's a big one. Um, most common injuries are probably knee injuries, shins, shin splints, knee injuries, stress fractures, probably. But that that's really with any sport. You're probably going to see shoulder injuries, knee injuries and foot injuries more than anything in military spec ops training. Fin recommendations as well. Uh, well, it depends on what you're training for. Um, I personally like, um, if I'm buying slip-on fins, I use a brand called Sporty, S-P-O-R-T-I. Real nice, easy, kind of like, build up in those to get your ankles used to bigger fins. Then I buy a pair of scuba fins that require the scuba booties. Um, and I usually go with something made from Cressy, Cressy frog fins. But if you're preparing for any military diving or swimming uh, training, they're probably going to use rocket fins or jet fins. So it kind of depends on what you're training for. Oh, let's see. Um, James says, I sent you a video a few weeks back. Knocked off 40 seconds on my swim last night. Nice. Current PR 904 down from 944. Thanks for your help. Hey, man. Good job putting in the work and listening. Good job being coachable. That means a lot. Really does. Because you're going to be coached and taught and you got to learn quickly. Um, that's really good. 
Made a bad excuse for skipping the pool today. Had to share a lane with a tall person. Was trying not to kick them in the face. <laughs> but kept kicking the lane marker. Oof. Yeah, that hurts. Um, yeah, my advice when that happens, instead of doing, you know, something with a big kick and you're sharing a lane worried about, you know, like, cause I, sometimes I'll swim with like an 80 year old person next to me. Last thing I want to be doing is using a scissor kick and cranking her in the face. Um, so I, uh, I'll just go into freestyle and just, you know, share the lane and stay skinny. At least you can work on some conditioning next time. Um, I'm on week three of the winter cycle. You told me I should change it up a bit, so I did. I need to focus a little more on my mile and a half, which is 9.50 right now. When in the week should I add running? Um, there's running into it. Um, depends on which one you're doing. Uh, but I... You know, you, I would do this. If you're lifting, add in, warm up with calisthenics to maintain your calisthenics, do your lifts, then cool down with cardio, All right? It could be a separate session later in the day too, if you wanted to, and just add your biking, running, swimming, whatever you feel like, rucking, whatever you feel like you want to add in as your cardio, add it in as a cool down. I think that's a great way to do it, especially if you want to get good at everything. You mean extra speed work? Yeah, that's what I mean, too. Can be a cool down with some intervals. You know, work on your 400s, 800s, you know, as part of a running workout and then cool it down with a nice, easy bike. So... I don't know what winter what li winter lift cycle are you on? Are you doing one of mine or on your own? Doing something. Because mine has running in it already. Right? If you're doing a winter lift cycle like this one, you're going to be running and swimming. And lifting. Yeah. Like on this day, doing bench press, doing some heavy rows. Got some weight vest pull-ups, shrugs, bicep overhead presses. Um, and then at the end, uh, after that lift cycle, you do eight 400s, rest with sit-ups. Then you swim five 300s. So this is a lift cycle with running in it. That lift cycle you're talking about, is it this one? The fall winter lift cycle or the seasonal tactical fitness periodization lift cycle? Because I got multiple lift cycles. This depends on what you're doing. And any one of them will have running in it. But yeah, if you're working on your mile and a half, my advice is practice some goal pace running. Cool down with some um, I don't know why you're asking these questions, Matthew, because there's running in the program. <laughs> I don't know if you need to add running in it, to be honest with you. I mean, if you want to add more running into it, absolutely. You can definitely do that. Do some 800s, 400s, do some mile repeats, for, you know, maintain your mile and a half. Or you can do it like we're doing it and do three weeks of lifting with one week of cows and cardio. Like if you're in the cycle we're on, next week is a cows and cardio week where we're doing 400s, 800s, running bleachers, doing all kinds of stuff. I took your advice and took out the double arm pull a few weeks ago, decided to put my head down and condition to do it. Now I can do the whole 500. Nice. 
Good. Either way, my my question to you, Justin, is are you faster with it or without it? Or does it matter? Right? Here's the thing. If you're just as fast with the CSS as opposed to, I'm sorry, with the breaststroke pullout as opposed to without it, then why do it? Just a debate. You know, read that article I posted up there. It's called The Pullout or Not CSS Debate. I was asking because you said focus a bit more on my weakness. And I thought like, yeah, you know what? This probably isn't the form to be saying this because one, I don't remember who or what you are. You know, send me an email, describe your situation, and I will have a more specific answer for you. But you can definitely add in, you know, 10 to 15 miles to the program if you need it. If you don't, don't do it. All right. Any other questions? Yeah, if you're doing the seasonal tactical fitness and you need to add mileage, there's a place to add mileage, right? So like, for instance, there's a workout in this one that says after all the lifts and everything, you do a run, run 10 minutes, what's the distance? Run the same distance, but run it faster. Right, that's one way to do it. If 10 minutes, you want to run more, make it 15 minutes and run 15 minutes faster. Right, so it's it's kind of up to you how you do it. You could just add more sets. You know, if four by 800 isn't enough, make it six by 800. You know, if you think you need more running, add it. If you think you need less running, don't do what I have in this book because this book is not a personalized written program for you to perfectly be in a progression with it, All right? Some weeks you might have to add mileage. Some weeks you might have to take away because you're feeling the sting of doing 20 miles a week when you weren't used to doing 20 miles a week. <clears throat> But, yeah, I get it. Yeah. Get a little faster on that mile and a half. Run some three-minute half miles. Get better at it. All right. Shoulder mobility is the cause of diving too deep off the wall. Yes. You want to see why? <laughs> because if this is you diving off the wall, what am I doing? Right? If this is you, you're probably going a little straighter. Right? So how you angle yourself off the wall, if you're angled like this in the water, whew, you can go straight down. Oh, my dog is barking. <laughs> So yeah, work on your shoulder mobility. Also, is that true when taking the underwater swim at Buds, you have to do a backflip when pushing off the wall and then go? No, you don't push off the wall on the first 25. You jump in feet first, do a front flip, then start your double arm pulls across the pool. Then on the other side, which is 25 meters away, you can use that wall to kick off and turn back and get your 50 meter done. When I use the double arm pull, I pass the yellow mark on the pool lane after the first kick, but without it, it takes two kicks to reach the yellow mark. I'll do two 500 meters with and without and let you know. Um, hey, if you got a good breaststroke pullout, great. I mean, there's nothing wrong with that. It's just a debate, and it's some people will keep it. Some people will get rid of it. 
I saw a guy get rid of it and he dropped his 500 by 50 seconds because he just sucked at the breaststroke pullout so much that it wasn't helping him. In fact, it was hurting him. So where are you on that spectrum is the big question. All right, folks. Looks like I'm going to wrap this up. Things are starting to stir in my house. I probably have more shoveling to do. So it's going to be one of those days. So you guys enjoy yours. And if you guys have questions, email me, stew at stewsmith.com. Happy to answer, especially if it's a little more personalized, like Matthews, you know, how many miles will the spring cycle bring me after the winter cycle? Um, well, once again, my generic spring training program will yield probably between 35 and 40 miles a week. Um, at the end, it will start off at 25 miles a week, I think. So um, if you need more, add more. If you need less, don't do as many. So I think that is the uh, I think that is the theme of the day, right? And if you have more specific questions uh, like that that might need a little more information from you, just email me, and I'm happy to answer those emails. So some things like I don't get enough back history from you guys whenever you guys ask a question. So I'm giving somewhat of a generic answer, right? If you want to get a little more specific and say, I'm a running athlete, I'm a swimming athlete, I lift, you know, 1,200 pounds of the big three, whatever, right? Give me some history so I can understand how to best answer you um, and go from there. All right, folks. Go to stewsmithfitness.com, save 15% with the L Live 15 coupon code. And um, if you got specific questions, send them. Stu at stewsmith.com. You can also send videos there, or you can DM me over at Instagram with a video, as long as it's less than a minute. Um, that should be able to stay up there, and I can critique it right off the uh, DM page. All right, folks, we'll see you next week. You guys have a good one.